I'm sorry for the blinking. I'm not really sure what that's for, but um, I don't think I even have time to uh, debug this, so <laughs> I, I hope it's not too bad. Anyways, thanks for coming. Um, uh, today I'll be talking about uh, elf crafting and some anti-analysis techniques uh, for the Linux platform that we might start uh, seeing uh, in malware. So uh, my name is Nacho San Millán. I'm a security researcher at a company in Tel Aviv called Intercer Labs. Um, I'm, a, I'm a malware reverse engineer and I play CTFs with Amnesia. I've been a radar contributor since 2016. And I'm also a Libel Master Contributor from BitLuckies, and that's my, my, my Twitter handle. So the outline of this presentation is gonna be very simple. I was, I'm gonna first talk about what is the uh, current state of the Linux threat landscape. <coughs> and this is important to understand the techniques that I'm gonna explain after, because, well, I'll, I'm, not gonna go, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about it right now, but first I'm gonna talk about the Linux threat landscape, and then I'm gonna talk about the techniques that I'm gonna expose today. So let's talk about the Linux threat landscape. So the Linux threat landscape uh, has a completely different distribution than other um, ecosystems such as Windows or Android. Um, and it really depends on the visibility you have for the devices that you have. So um, this is a very, very average um, uh, diagram of the distribution of current, the current distribution of malware today. And, we, and as we can see, we can see that there is a lower, uh, big ratio of crypto miners and DDoS bots, but as well there is uh, other kind of malware like file infectors, rootkits, as in other ecosystems. Um, and also, uh, we have seen uh, various uh, nation states that have deployed um, Linux malware um, in recent years, uh, from the NSA, CIA, um, APT, uh, Russian APTs, and even uh, Chinese APTs that we know, but there are probably uh, way more issues that we don't have enough visibility to, to claim. So what is the, the actual challenge in Linux um, malware detection? So malware, Linux malware has one problem, and it's uh, the low visibility of, of Linux malware. And obviously, low visibility uh, implies the low detection rate. So um, that's basically, in short terms, what's going on. So the low visibility uh, uh, has a direct impact in the, in the detection of this malware. So me and my company and my team, uh, we conducted uh, different threat hunting operations. And of what we have to, uh, for uh, currently of 2019, we were able to detect five different implants groups in which two of them were actually uh, linked with um, nation states. And um, the thing is, like, uh, before we actually reported these samples, they were completely under the radar, so they had, like, zero detections. So that's pretty remarkable, and the complexity of these malware is usually not mm, that complex. It's just that mm, the heuristics that are being applied today, they're just very, very crappy, and there's not that much um, demand on uh, Linux uh, detection. However, there has been a, an array of awareness uh, from different companies in, the, in recent years, and just to, la just to name a few, there's probably way more, but I'm just skipping here. Um, companies like Cisco, Talos, NetLab360, and Malware Master, oh, well, Malware Master is not a company, obviously, but uh, there's a research group that have done a lot of work uh, in terms of uh, Linux detection. So what's happening next is that uh, no matter what, no matter how much time it takes, uh, malware is, Linux malware is doomed to increase in visibility. That's gonna be a fact, and at some point, there's gonna be a boom, and Linux malware is gonna become very, very complex, which is not the current state of Linux malware today. And that's very, very important to understand. And because of the, <coughs> because of the increase of visibility, Linux malware uh, detection is gonna uh, perform better. And due to that, uh, threat actors are gonna, are gonna tend to invest more resources into making uh, their implants a bit more uh, complex, as it's happening in other ecosystems, such as Windows or even Android. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the elf crafting techniques, and let me just say that these techniques that I'm gonna explain are not like heartbreaking cutting edge uh, technologies. Uh, this is not what this talk is about. It's about exposing some techniques that we might start seeing in Linux malware um, as uh, ways of you know, uh, um, you know, implementing different type of uh, anti-analysis techniques. But they're not like super crazy uh, protection solutions or anything in, in, in that way. Okay, so this section is going to be separated. I, at the beginning of this talk, I had a way more to way more content I could uh, present. So I divided into the, these techniques that you see here. So first, I'm going to talk um, about parsing struggles with elf binaries. Um, then I'm going to talk about how we can use relocations um, to hide or even to implement some kind of uh, analysis techniques. And then I'm going to talk about a project that I work for some time, although it's a work in pro progress and very experimental. That is hiding. Um, dynamic strings uh, from uh, dynamic executable binaries. 
So let's talk about elf parsing struggles. So let's so be, uh, before talking about everything, let's talk about uh, one uh, specific artifact in alphas, which are uh, elf sections. So elf sections comprise solid formation for linking a target object file to be a running uh, elf executable. And it's very important to understand that sections are needed just on link time, but not on runtime. And this is important for reasons that I'm going to explain in a bit, in just right now. And sections are comprised in an elf binary in, in a section header table, and, and a, a, section header, a section header table contains uh, structures of elf SHDR. And sections can hold different content, uh, ranging from code, symbols, strings, relocations, etc. Okay. So this diagram is literally um, what well, we so the, the one in left is a uh, is a diagram of an elf binary when it's in when it's in disk and it has sections. So you can see sections, and I'm pretty sure that everybody's familiar with these sections like text, data, whatever. Uh, but then when it gets stored to memory, in comparison with other uh, formats, what happens is that there is another uh, elf activa that are called segments. And all of the sections get grouped by in, uh, into different segments that have the same attribute. So instead of loading each, each, each specific section, what happens is that sections with the same attributes get loaded in a segment. And there is even sections that will never get loaded to memory, like for example, symbol tables, STR tab, or even like the section header table. Okay, so because of this very reason, sections, section information can be completely removed or modified from a given elf binary because it's not needed in memory, it's not loaded to memory, so it's not needed for execution. But uh, this section information uh, is what actually contains all the symbolic information in elf binaries. Um, but this can be manipulated or even deleted. So obviously attackers can abuse these uh, to misguide analysts and parsers that heavily rely on section information. And some uh, example use case of this technique can be sim uh, symbol scrambling or even section scrambling. So let's have a little example. Like, let's say that uh, we have scrambled the section table, just the section table, we haven't done anything else. Obviously this is gonna cause some anomalies. So if we actually try to like read, for example, the dynamic, se uh, dynamic segment or, or the dynamic entries of an L file, a, we read it, which is a naive parser, then we see this kind of thing, which we cannot really understand anything. Same thing with naive disassemblers like object dump. Nobody in the right mind is using object dump, but this is just to illustrate uh, my point. And even GDB. And GDB is a bit more worrying because a lot of people are, are using GDB. And GDB, if he sees something weird in the sections, he says, this is not an executable format that I can, ro uh, that I can load, so I'm not gonna load it. So this is obviously a, a bit of a pain in the ass. So if we say, if we see sections that don't make sense or they are corrupted, the best is to neglect them, okay? And we can easily uh, make a parser don't interpret sections by patching these three fields in the elf header. So we can load a binary to Radare in Radare and then Radare has a, a um, sort of like a way of interpreting a, an ELF header. We can use these commands that you see and then we can just patch those specific fields to, uh, with zero and then um, a given parser will think that there's no sections to parse. So the problem with this is that if we actually remove the sections, we are removing also the symbolic information within an ELF binary. And that's a problem because a lot of these assemblers and different tools don't necessarily need to be disassemblers, uh, rely heavily on, on symbolic information in sections. However, there are ways of retrieving partially the symbolic information from ELF files rely on segments. And this is from the dynamic segment. So in the dynamic segment, there is two entries, which is STR tab and SIM tab, which, are, which have the same directions of the uh, DIN STR and DIN SIM uh, sections. And then for, uh, and you can retrieve imports and uh, other symbols that are using dynamic linking. And then for exports, um, you can use the PTG, PTG and new E frame. However, this is a more uh, complex process. However, I wrote a proof of concept a while ago. So, um, uh, so just feel free to check it out. Okay, so now that we have sections clear, let's talk a bit more about other, other a bit more advanced techniques. Advanced, I mean, this is just you know, going progressively with nothing to something. So there is a way also to interpret wrongly uh, a parser, uh, a binary, an ELF binary, modifying one byte. So as we saw, ELF, ELF section manipulation can provoke parsing problems, and this is um, a, obviously, I mean, we, we just saw it. Uh, however, ELF, uh, ELF fields can also be crafted and can be crafted in a way that can corrupt an ELF, an, uh, the interpretation of an ELF file in much more easier ways. So, Let's go back to Radari and let's see the uh, ELF header. So from all the artifacts that are here, there is one specific byte, which is that, which it could be even a bit, but just for, a second, like, just for the granularity of the field is one byte, so I'm just gonna call it one byte. Um, and this byte is the, uh, file, the files data encoding, in other words, the endiness. 
So if you are able to change this byte to the opposite endiness, you can cause, and this is how you can, uh, we change the endiness of this uh, file, for example. For example, if you read, uh, you use readf to read this file, then it tries to interpret the whole file with the wrong endiness, and you see this kind of uh, output. Uh, not only that, but for example, Jidra, Jidra usually, uh, when you load an EL file, will, will actually tell you, okay, this ELF file is for x86, or it's for MIPS, or whatever. Uh, in, that, in that case, it won't, so you actually need to, to analyze it with a different tool. So, and then with Binary Ninja, uh, Binary Ninja just says, okay, I can, I can handle this. And Radare, which is like the Swiss knife, uh, says, okay, this has this endiness, let me load this endiness, you know? So like, fair enough, you know? But it obviously, it's not, it's not what, we, what we want. The only disassembler that has actually handled this gracefully was Ida, and it's probably because it's using further heuristics in order to detect the true endiness of the file. Um, and the, the, what is the main problem here? The main problem is that most, most static parsers, in order to parse an ELF file, the first thing they do is they check the endiness of the file, and then in regards to the endiness of the file, they interpret the rest of the field. So usually, if you, if you try to interpret the, uh, the machine type with the wrong endiness, then Mm, then you won't, you won't get a right, uh, a right feel, a right interpretation of, of that. And this technique can highly impact uh, automation of dynamic, dynamic analysis of ELF files, uh, especially for IoT, because this is how most DDoS bots get analyzed. They just piped into a sandbox or something. And obviously, if you don't know which architecture the binary is, then you don't kind of really analyze it. The, the thing here, the funny thing is that the actual kernel, uh, the kernel loaded actually doesn't care about the endiness. So like the, run, the file will actually run even though you change the endiness. And this is, what, this is because when the, the Linux kernel gets compiled, uh, depending on which architecture gets compiled, there is all, always a predefined endiness. So the Linux, the Linux kernel will always use the native endiness to interpret the file. Okay, so what's the circumvention of this? So there is not that many endiness that a file can have. There is big endian, little endian, and middle endian, which I only I only seen that in uh, CTFs, so you can literally like just interpret an ELF file um, and, and parse specific fields, and you, where the the value of them are is deterministic, and just parse them with different endings until one of them makes sense, so that that way you can understand the what is the right endings of the file. Okay, that's one technique. Let's talk about another one, which is hiding dynamic entries from the dynamic segment. So. Dynamic compiled binary is uh, contain a segment that is called PT dynamic, and this segment is is created because all of the information needed for a dynamically linked binary to run is has to have a place to save all this information, and that's, that's that place is the dynamic segment. So this, as I said, this segment contains all the information for dynamic linking to to happen, and a dynamically linked binary is great. Sorry. Well, <laughs> um, dynamically linked binaries uh, with defectious uh, dynamic segment will most likely crash. Um, okay, so the thing is like Android, the Android Packers theme uh, right now is much more mature in terms of uh, uh, evasion, uh, te uh, evasion techniques and uh, obfuscation than a standalone ELF malware is, and that's for obvious reasons because obviously there are private companies that are in this field and there is a lot more, much more investment that is applied to uh, come up with obfuscation techniques as well for uh, non-native to native uh, artifacts. So, uh, but what is uh, important to highlight is that uh, most ELF found in, in APKs are usually share objects, and share objects are dynamic artifacts. So this technique can be uh, can be applied to uh, also uh, dynamic uh, uh, share objects in, in, in APK. So how this uh, research start, started is that I have a friend um, that is a very good uh, Android uh, researcher, and he he told me look, look look at this file. This is weird. I don't know how to interpret it. Blah blah. So I put this file in Radar and I try to see uh, whether it had any symbols, and it didn't. Uh, I tried to see whether there was something in the dynamic segment, and I saw that the dynamic segment was really weird looking. As you can see, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the ELF file format, but if, doesn't, if it doesn't have a symbol or a string table, then it's a, very, it's, it's a weird uh, dynamic segment. So at first I thought, well, this must be a section problem, because why not? You know, okay, well, let me try things. Okay, maybe sections, let me patch the sections. And then when I did that, uh, I got the same output, so this must have th th this anomaly must be in the segments. So after analyzing the segments for a while, then I understood that the problem was with with this offset, and uh, the way I look at it is because I run the binary, the binary run didn't crash or anything, and I look at the address of the dynamic segment, 
And then I look at the file offset of the dynamic segment, and they didn't match. So what was going on? After some time, I came up to the conclusion that this is what was going on. So the dynamic segment, every segment, uh, gets mapped uh, instead of besides the stack and, and some other segments. But in general, every, every segment that you see gets mapped within one load segment. So the dynamic segment gets loaded into the writable load, load segment. And the thing is, like, uh, because these segments get loaded, the, the only segments that get loaded are the load segments. And the dynamic segment must be mapped in the same address that the segment, that the segment header of the dynamic segment says. Uh, the file offset of the dynamic segment doesn't never get, it never gets used because uh, this, let, let's say that this segment, which is the which is the the, the actual data that uh, this this segment points to, uh, is so basically this segment is comp this segment is comprising this segment. Okay, so the offset of this segment is pointless because it's never going to be accessed. But parsers use this segment to locate the dynamic segment, so you can craft a fake looking dynamic segment as somewhere in the file, even appended to the end of the file, point it there, and you will get a wrong, a wrong interpretation of the, of the dynamic segment. As long as the dynamic segment entry, uh, the, the dynamic segment header, has the genuine address, the virtual address, where the dynamic segment has to be mapped, everything is going to be fine. Detect this, and the, the, the way to detect this is literally, so the dynamic segment offset has this, this equation. With, so, um, okay, so if we do that, if we do, if we, if we do that exact equation that I, I just explained, and we restore uh, the, the, the right fields, then when we try to parse that dynamic, uh, that, the, the dynamic segment of that file, then we see all of this that is not by any means what we were, but what it was at the beginning of, of this process. And then if we, out, if we input this into radar, then finally we, we get symbols. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about another thing, which is relocation hijacking. So, relocation, so L files in comparison with other file formats have a very, very sophisticated relocation system. And, this, uh, and these relocations are held into, in, a, um, in, a, in, in a relocation table. And this relocation table is populated by L rel of L rel um, type structures. So the, 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 the blueprint of these structures is this. So they're pretty, pretty much the same. The only difference is that a, a rela entries have a specific, an additional uh, uh, field, which is an R addend that is actually used uh, for the actual resolving of the relocation. OK, so there is a lot of different techniques to, do, to apply code injection. However, in the code injection process, there is two challenges. One is to actually craft the, an ELF file in a way in which uh, some code can be injected properly without breaking anything. And another one is to how to hijack control flow of execution so that you can at some point pivot to this uh, injected code. Um, there are well-known techniques in order to do this, like, for example, this is some. Uh, so you have PLT redirection, inline hooks, in initialization of finalization function pointer uh, injection, global offset table poisoning, etc. right? The problem with this is that these techniques are very, very obvious, and it, they're generally very easy to detect. Um, however, there are ways uh, to use relocations in order to like uh, hide these hide uh, these techniques to the naked eye, right? So I came up with two, uh, two techniques, uh, an entry point obfuscation uh, technique based on relocation tampering. It's used in pi-binaries, but it can be used um, literally in any other binary. And then the other one is hiding constructors in dynamic and statically linked binaries. So uh, I'll, explain, um, I'll explain it in a moment. I just want to say that uh, detecting malicious relocations is actually not trivial. Because literally the nature of relocations is hot patching the binary on load time. So when you have some write primitive like this, in order, uh, it's not that trivial to say whether this is legitimate or not, right? Uh, so relocation analysis is hard by nature, and advanced heuristics usually have to be applied in order to recognize whether a relocation has malicious inten intentions or not. And on the other hand, uh, relocations are really easy to tamper. They're not very uh, difficult uh, data structures. So and, and once you understand it, uh, it's, it's very easy. So let's talk about the first technique. So, so pi executables are uh, ET dyn type L binaries, so they are dynamic binaries. And the image, the, the thing with pi binaries, pi means uh, position independent executable. And the image base will be randomly chosen on, on load time, okay? 
So virtual, virtual addresses in disk in the whole in all of the fields of an L file are relative to the image base, but the image base in disk is zero. Okay, so zero is actually a valid uh, offset in in a Pi binary. Okay, but let me let me let me show you this. Okay, so here I have the three things. Okay. Uh, I'm going to publish all of the source code, so I don't want to waste too much time uh, opening the source code I explained to you uh, because it's pointless. But uh, I will publish all the source code so you can check it uh, afterwards. So let's just copy uh, like some random binary like BNLS. And if we actually um, check LS, we can see that it has a valid entry point. Uh, if you see that the entry point really looks like an offset, but it's really a valid address. So what we can do is uh, read, I mean, execute this this file that is the, just the binary of the technique that I implemented. You can run against this ls binary, and it does some things. So if we actually check this with Radare, well, if we actually check the entry point, uh, we can see that the, the entry point is zero, right? If we are, if we open this with Radare. Bigger? Yeah, yeah, sure. Sorry? What? The compositor? The what? I, I don't understand, sorry. Uh, like, it's very, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, sorry about that. Anyways, uh, you can see that the entry point is zero, right? So if we open the file with Radare, uh, we will see that where it should be the entry point is really the, set, the text section, so this is not the actual entry point. So if we execute the, the file with Radare, it doesn't really matter, we just execute it, and then we see the mappings, and we, we check the first, the first mapping, which is usually where uh, the binary gets loaded. We see that the 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 elf header, where the, here there should be an elf header. Um, if we see uh, it has been uh, overwritten with some trampoline, and this trampoline jumps to the actual entry point. So how this works? Uh, uh, one second. Oh yeah. So how this works? So this works uh, in this way. So um, basically, we have a, uh, just some binary that the entry point is where it should be. So we change the entry point to any arbitrary location. Uh, if it's in the code segment, you obviously need to change the attributes of the code segment to be writable. And we set a relocation to be applied at that specific address. And we do the relocation in a way where a, a relative jump or a near jump gets written. So what happens at long time is that uh, relocations get applied way before constructor get, get executed, or even be, or way, way, way before main, the main uh, the entry point gets executed. So then the so the relocation takes place, and then the relocation jumps back to the original entry point. This is how uh, this specific thing is implemented. So we can say that. The real entry, the offset, is at zero, which is the address that it doesn't necessarily have to be zero, but with pi binaries at zero is cool because you think that it's not initialized. But the offset is set where the relocation wants to take place. The R info field is the actual, uh, it has different fields with different masks, but usually you can set up any type of relocation that you want. And then for this specific type of relocation, which is R x sixty four sixty four. Uh, basically, the, the equation to resolve this relocation is adding the value of the, of the given symbol with the addend. So you can play with that. So for example, I added some arbitrary value in the, in the value of the symbol, like one, two, three, four, five, six. And you can apply some equation that resolves to the same value that you want. And then at the end, you, you append a E9, which is the opcode of a, of a near jump. And that way you can, you can do that. So how do you detect this? So obviously, if you don't know about this, it's not trivial to detect it, but if you know, then the only thing you have to do is to see which relocation is taking place in the entry point. So if you see that the entry point is lo looking weird, 
and it points to nothing or something, and you don't have a constructor that is interacting with that, with that uh, entry point in, the, in a way that maybe gets decrypted with a constructor, which it happens. Uh, then check the relocations, because maybe there is a relocation that is taking place right at that offset, and it's changing the control flow of execution. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about another use case, which is hiding constructors in dynamic and static executables. So constructors can be accessed uh, very easily by the dynamic segment. And in the dynamic segment, uh, usually you have init array and finite array, and init array, and also you can find the sizes of them. So basically, init array and finite array are arrays of function pointers, and this gets executed way before main. Uh, so there is a way of hiding this from plain sight, again, using relocation, and it's pretty simple as the technique I, ex I explained before uh, with, for dynamic link, uh, dynamically linked binaries. So we can set up a relocation that patches just in time this init array, and then because constructors get, get executed before relocations, then the relocations will get executed and uh, we'll be able to like uh, do this. And then for the thing is that with statically, statically linked binaries is a completely different story because um, statically linked binaries only support one type of relocation that are, that are called I relative. So based on the documentation, uh, this type of relocation is the same as the conventional R relative uh, relocation. The only difference between the both is that an actual, so the relocation value is actually the result of, uh, of a function, okay? And the reasons are not really important to be honest, but is be, uh, because the statically linked uh, binaries have different implementations of the same function, and sometimes you wanna use a specific implementation over another, so that's why there is this, uh, these things uh, implemented. So we check out the GCC, uh, the glibc code. We can see that here is the check of the relocation uh, type. And uh, if it's rx86, well, if it's i relative relocation, uh, then this function will be executed. With this function, essentially what it does is uh, interprets, interprets the, the, um, the argument as a function pointer, and then the, the result of that function will be the reference to a specific value. So these functions, uh, are super like atomic in the sense that this is one example of, of these functions like uh, for example for ST, str copy and you can see that the only thing is being applied is that there is some uh, logical logical uh, operations and then regarding the the answer then one one implementation the address of one implementation of, of that function gets returned or another okay so the thing is like because this the thing is like looking at this code, I thought like these locations cannot really be, they don't necessarily need to be applied on memory. They can be applied on disk. So there is an approach that we can do that is we can emulate all these functions, populate the global offset entries that these functions should be uh, initialized, and then we need to create and then once one, when, when that happens, then we have all of the relocations in the relocation table free to Tampa. Okay. In the proof of concept I'm gonna show, I, I just changed one, but you can literally encode, like I encapsulate a payload that gets loaded, and each relocation writes to uh, the next place in memory, and you can just load uh, a payload that way, which is actually pretty cool. Um, so anyways, you create a fake iPhone function that returns the address of some arbitrary malicious code. You change an I relative, uh, you change an I relative relocation entry so that the addend field points to the address of the fake iPhone function and you change the offset of relocation entry to point to a constant constructor or destructor. Again, this is a use case, but this has way more, uh, way more um, um, different ways in which you can uh, abuse this. So I wrote a 30-line script that does exactly this with SL and stuff. Um, for these kind of things, Radar is very, very useful. So anyways, let me show you this. Okay, so here I'm gonna show you, this is a, this is a proof of concept, okay, but basically we have a main function and we have a payload function and the payload never gets referenced by main. So the main thing is here how we can uh, abuse a relocation to call payload at some point. And the implementation of payload is literally, it decrypts main, or it decrypts, it decodes main in this case. Again, this is not like anything sophisticated, but it's just an example so on, on a way how, how we can leverage this, this type of things. So, so let's copy again, VNLS, and let's run this against VNLS. Wait, what? What the fuck? 
want. It was working like one minute ago. I don't really know what's. Anyways, uh, let me just run it with uh, the test. So here, if we open the file with Rodaren, and we go to main, we see that main is broken. Like this, like this doesn't make any sense, right? So if we run this, it works. So what's going on? Usually, these people will go will, will be like, will be like, okay, where is the Where's the, where is the constructor table? Oh, it's here. OK, so what is this? So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, no, this is not the right location, sorry. Oh, it is? Oh, it's frame dummy, sorry, I didn't see it. So anyways, this is nothing, okay? This, 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 have, this doesn't have, this doesn't do anything with main or anything. Okay, so again, if we see the relocations, um, there is something here that doesn't work. Obviously, it's not trivial to, to see which one it is. I will explain later. Uh, the, I will show later the before and after. And, but anyways, it's a relocation that is doing all that. And now let me show you the static one. So, so here uh, is, this, is the very. It has the same format as the one before. The only thing is that we have a fake irreloc, irreloc function or ifunc function that um, returns the address of, of the payload. Okay the payload function. OK. So here we can run the Python script that I showed you before. We wrote our end. <laughs> and here what basically it do does is that it resolves each relocation in disk. So now all of the relocation table is free to tamper. So if I compile this, and I compile this uh, without tampering, and we execute this one, we see that it's only executed main. But if we execute the test, which is the, the one that we tamper, it executes the main and the payload. And it does this with the relative relocations. And obviously, here is very, very easy to see which one is the one. But obviously, if you modify all of them, and you you can also you can do like based on the number of relocations that that you have you can uh, do something with it to write some arbitrary code or whatever you know but there is many different ways in which you can abuse this. Okay, so how can you detect this these two things? So um, so how do you detect this? So this is the binary before it was actually tampered with the relocation thing, and this is after. Before after before after. So the only thing that is changed is that. So obviously, in order to detect that, is, it's not trivial. Um, so again, you will need to do some heuristics in order to see whether a relocation is, is like genuine or not. And for the detection of static executables, uh, the, this, the i-relative abuse, um, I haven't really figured out a way to detect this, because the problem is that there is an actual way, which is a, seeing where the i-relative um, function, uh, functions point to. And these functions have are symbols and have to be of type STTI func. The problem with it, with this is that uh, in statically linked binaries, the symbolic information can be completely removed. And since static binaries don't contain uh, a, um, some like um, like a dynamic segment or anything like that, uh, this is n this might not be always accessible, right? So it's a fix. It's a way to detect this, but not really, to be honest. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the last technique that I'm going to present.
And this is uh, very experimental. I was working on this for like uh, two months, and it was a while ago. And it's so experimental that it's only working on my, on my VM. <laughs> so like, uh, I have to do some work on it. But it's a proof of concept that what I'm going to explain it can be done. So basically, this is uh, how, can you how can you remove the NSTR table uh, from a dynamically linked binary? So the DNSTR is a string table uh, from the DIN sim symbol table. And these two artifacts uh, cannot be removed in a dynamic, in a dynamic link binary, because if they do, the, the binary just won't run. And I'm pretty sure the linker has some, some checks uh, in order to, for this to, just, to not have an actual crash to just say, like, I can't run this or whatever. So um, usually other string tables, uh, like str tab or uh, say um, str tab can be removed, because they, not, they, not, they don't even get loaded to memory. But that's not the case with DIN STR. And at the all dynamically linked binaries uh, have this, uh, the, this string table. And this is usually when you, f when you put a file into this assembler and you see the imports, this is where uh, the, the actual names of the imports come from the string table. So the following technique will explain an approach of how we can get this string table removed. And basically, when we open a file, you don't know what is an import or whatnot. Um, so before that, we need, to, we need to know a bit how the, the PLT mechanism works, which is basically the way that imports get resolved. Uh, usually, there is a way for a binary to not contain a PLT, but uh, it's not very common, and to be honest, uh, who cares? So basically, this is how the PLT section looks. So the PLT section has one main entry, which is uh, it's a special entry. And then every import has sort of uh, its own entry and has uh, jumps and stuff like that. So the first jump is actually jumping to the global offset table entry for a specific symbol. Usually when, when the global offset table is not resolved, the address contained in that, uh, in that address will point back to this address, to this push. This value is the actual uh, index index of the symbol in the relocation table. And then it jumps to the first entry. And it will push this value, which I will explain now. And then we'll jump to some location that I will explain now as well. So the first code entries have specific values. And two of them actually get resolved in runtime. Um, so the first code entry is the address of the dynamic segment. Uh, the second is the address of a data structure called link map, which is a data structure that contains all the information of the loaded modules. And the third is uh, the address of, uh, of, the, of a linker export that, that is called a DL runtime uh, resolve. So literally, what happens is that when the, when the relocation index gets pushed, then it jumps to the first PLT entry. It pushes the link map uh, data structure, and then it calls the runtime resolve. So the reason we cannot actually, we need to depend on, uh, on strings is that if we see the actual linker code that does the symbol resolution, we can see that it's using the string table to do the symbol lookup. So uh, if we wanted to implement something like this, we would actually need to instrument the linker, which sometimes is not what we want. Um, so, but, we, but, but what we can do is um, we can implement a hash-based resolver, and there is actual algorithms in order to do this that the linker implements. Um, these are very broad and, hard, and they're hard to explain, so I'm not going to cover them. But feel free to to look at for DT has and DT new has uh, uh, usages, and it's just what I just explained. So the approach basically is hash all dynamic symbols, strings of sub, of the subject binary, and remove uh, the dynamic string table. Save all the computer hashes in a hash table, and make sure that the hashes are placed in the same uh, in the hash table as the same order as the relocations were. Inje inject a custom hash resolver into the target binary along with the, with the hashing table to resolve the symbols, and then inject a constructor that replaces on, on runtime uh, the third got entry, which is the export to the DL uh, runtime resolve, and make it point to your own uh, resolver. So basically, this is what happens. So you have a binary. You inject a new PT load. You inject. You you have the hash resolver code. You you computate and remove the the dynamic string table. And then you initialize a pointer in an init array um, uh, in init array so that it actually patches the third code entry uh, and runtime. So let me show you this. So for this, I'm going to run a VM because, as I said, they say they change something and it doesn't work in Ubuntu 18. So, okay. So, in order to illustrate this, I'm gonna copy VNIP, for example. Oops. Fuck. Can't see my keyboard. 
And then now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this against IP. And what we can see is that it's locating every symbol, and it's hashing every symbol. And the, it, the only one that can hash is Lipsy star main because that was, that's the one in charge, the, the one function in charge to execute the constructor, so we can't uh, you know, uh, hash that one. But we can do, uh, we can uh, hash the rest, we can, uh, so we inject the constructor and then. So we execute IP, we see that it works normally, but in order to illustrate how it actually works, I'm gonna do the same thing. But um, I'm gonna do it with, um, sorry, what am I thinking? I'm gonna do it with uh, a, a test that I have here. So this is very, obviously it's nothing, it's like fopen, printf, pow, so all of the three are imports. So let's run the same thing against test. It does the same thing in different scales. So it has puts, it has libc star main, it has pause, and it has open. If we execute test, we see that it works, okay? So if we see this, we radar it. Well, sorry. So we can see that the three imports, they're not really no if there are imports or not, you know? So if we step to the call to the first import, we see that it jumps to the PLT. Uh, the, go, the, the global offset table of that entry is not gonna be resolved, so it's jumping to the next instruction. It pushes three, it jumps to the first PLT entry, it pushes the link map, and it jumps, and this jump should redirect to the linker, but instead it jumps to a constructor, and then uh, after this, it resolves everything, blah, blah, blah. And then some point here, here it jumps the, the calls the import, and then here uh, returns to the original location. Okay, so what is the output of the, what is the outcome of this? So if we actually try to see the symbols. We see that the, there is no no string names. In, in Ida, actually, what happens is that we see these strings, but if we try to see the imports, there is nothing there. And Radari, as we saw, um, is the same thing. It's just that the, the call to the imports look like they're called to uh, to some export or whatever, a, a self-contained uh, function from the binary or something like that. Okay, so conclusion. Now, the LFAR format is very flexible, uh, more than we can think. And parsing, parsing anomalies are easy to implement, con injection, uh, might start becoming more common as more complex implants arise. Uh, relocations can be used, as we saw, to hide conventional control flow hijacking methodologies in ways that are not that easy to detect as conventional uh, control flow hijacking methodologies. Um, L files are, can be easily abused for anti analysis purposes, uh, but they're not being do, it's not being done just yet, but it will be. Trust me, it will be. And we should expect an increase of Linux model complexity in, in coming years. Okay, any questions? Tim's. Hi. Uh, just, are you going to share the slides afterwards, or yeah, yeah uh, on the Telegram channel, yeah. or uh, no, on the GitHub uh, repo. Your GitHub. Uh, oh, you mean the code or the slides? The slides. The slides are. We have a uh, GitHub repo oh. of the conference. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, really great research. Thanks. So. Appreciate it. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, I saw you solved most of them with static methods, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry? You solved most of the obfuscation uh, thing with yeah, the static? Yeah, there are static analysis, yeah. Is there a way to do it dynamically? Like load it without running it and then doing the analysis? In, in which scenario? Any of them? I mean, the third scenario is mostly, uh, uh, oh, you mean like to apply the obfuscation on runtime? Yeah, like run it, let it load completely, resolve everything, and then dump it and anal analyze it. Um, I mean, some of these techniques are uh, strictly for static analysis, and one, ha one has to understand that most of the malware are not being analyzed manually. More of the, more of, more, most of these pipelines, in order to analyze malware or even classify malware, are automated. Mm -hmm. And some of the, so 
some of the uh, static analysis techniques that I've shown will probably break some of these pipelines. So that's where the value is. Obviously, if a researcher looks at the binary and just loads the binary, probably doesn't even have to understand the yellow file format. You know what I mean? Just looks at the assembly and that's it. Mm -hmm. So some of these uh, techniques are really just for statically, uh, static uh, analysis uh, purposes, like uh, static, uh, breaking static analysis in a sense. Okay, thanks. More questions? Nope, thanks. Okay. Thank you.